I'm going to walk you guys through how to take apart one of these Kohler XT7 Courage engines. And first thing that we're going to do is take off the top cover here. There are four T15 Torx that we got to take off, starting back here. The second one here, and the third one here, and the fourth one here. To take off the cover, you lift up on the back of it and then slide it forward. Unhook the spring, string. And then these are going to be your four T15 Torx into the bowl. Next thing we're going to take off is this cover here. Um, to do that, you're going to need to take the gas cap off. There are two 8 millimeter screws inside of this part. They're a little hard to get out right now, so I'm going to leave those be until I take off the top part here. Uh, pretty much everything else will be 10 millimeter. And those are the three 10 millimeter nuts. We can now lift up on this. And inside of here will be the two eight millimeter ones. Now that we have the top cover off, uh, we can go ahead and take off the pull cord assembly. And this just lifts straight up. And you'll notice as you pull on the string, there are these little claws that you kind of go out kind of like a cat's claws. And that's what's going to grab onto the inside of our uh, pull cord catch there to spin the engine up. And the next piece we'll take off is this cover. And what this ends up doing is as our fan sucks air into the engine, it's gonna direct it over the cylinder head right here to help cool the hottest part of the engine where that cylinder head and cylinder is. And now that that's off, there are these three little spacer pieces that we'll take off and put in the bag so we don't lose those. And now we're going to move to the side of the engine and take off our air filter housing. To take off the cover, you're going to turn this little knob right here. And once you've unscrewed it enough, it will unhook, swing out, and come off. And the air filter will normally stay inside there, just like that. Now to take out the air filter, that simply comes out. And the next part we're going to take off is the little air filter housing. Again, these are 10 millimeter. There's two of the nuts right here and then a bolt right there.
two of those. And this is going to be the one long bolt with the whole threaded portion. And now this will come off. And more than likely this tube is going to get stuck on there. And so you just pull this off. And now the air filter housing assembly will come off. And underneath that what you'll notice is there is the fuel filter right here. So as gasoline goes from the gas tank through the fuel line it will get filtered before it goes into the carburetor. We're going to disconnect that, use pliers or needle nose pliers, squeeze the clip, move that up, and now that'll come undone. And to remove the carburetor, what we need to do is gently slide it over, turn it so that the linkage lines up with the little slot right there, unhook it, and then unhook the spring. Now on the carburetor, there's the float bolt right here. They also have a screw bolt that you could take out to drain the fuel if you wanted to uh, winterize it or drain all the gasoline out of it. The next piece to come off is the heat shield to prevent engine heat from heating up our gasoline too much. And that should be like that. Now when you take a look at the carburetor, um, the throttle plate has two positions. This is going to be throttle plate closed, blocking off airflow to slow the engine down or make it idle. And then to rev it up, if you turn this, now the throttle plate inside is open. That allows maximum airflow and that's what would allow the engine to speed up um, or uh, pick up RPMs. So that's a closed throttle, that's an open throttle. And inside the carburetor, if you turn it around, way inside of there you will see a little uh, brass colored uh, piece, cylinder piece sticking up right about there. Um, that's going to be where the venturi happens and as the air picks up speed, um, it's going to cause fuel to be sucked up from the carburetor bowl and it'll actually go out that little opening right there kind of in the middle. And then that's how the fuel gets mixed in with the air that goes past it. And that's based off the principle faster moving air creates less pressure, kind of like an airplane wing. So as the air speeds up right there, it sucks the fuel up and mixes it in with it. Next part we'll take off is the ignition coil. Uh, once again, both of them are 10 millimeter. You do need to use a 10 millimeter wrench to take off the gold colored stud. The gold colored stud goes where the coil is. And you also need to use the screw that has all the threads on it right there for the coil. If you use one of the other long screws, it will break that. Now there's a plug right here. Simply pull on that. And then the spark plug ends wire might be connected up to the spark plug. So gently pull on that. And now your ignition coil is off. We're going to move back to the top of the engine and take off the flywheel and pull cord catch. Inside of the top here is a 19 millimeter nut that we need to take off.
you will need to use an extension with the ratchet. Otherwise, the handle of the ratchet is going to hit there. There's the 19 millimeter nut, the pull cord catch, and now you can see the top of the flywheel. It is important to know that there's a little notch right here. That little notch must line up with this little indent right here in the top of the flywheel. If it doesn't line up, then it gets bent. After that, we take our cooling fan off, and it's made out of plastic, I suspect, to make it a little cheaper, possibly even a little lighter. And you'll see there's little four little pegs right here that need to line up with those. And now we can take the flywheel off. Um, to take the flywheel off, the easiest way to do it is to lift up and then tap the side with a hammer. Now before you do that, take the nut and put it back on so the flywheel doesn't literally go flying in the air. And we're going to lightly lift up, taking a plastic hammer. And now the flywheel is loose. If you forget to put the nut on the top and you push, pull too hard, it can go flying up in the air. So put that piece on. Now I got our flywheel. What you will notice is there's a little keyway right there, a little slot. There's also two little squares here, and they are magnetic. And that's part of what creates the spark. On the crankshaft side of it, we've got our woodruff key right here. And that's what aligns the flywheel to the proper timing with the crankshaft. And now we'll take the gas tank off. Gas tank is held on by two studs up top, and then a bolt down here. When you take this off, do not take those two out because they go into plastic and they will end up stripping out the gas tank. And now we'll take those off. You're again going to need to use the boxed end of your 10 millimeter. And now those come off. And what you're going to notice is the gas tank gets stuck here because this piece is still on. So now we're going to take that off next. There are two bolts that hold it on, technically three, but we've already taken the third one out with the air filter. And these are the short 10 millimeter bolts. And then unhook our spring. So short bolts and a short bolt. Now the gas tank will come completely off. Now, the gas tank cap, something to know about this, it does have a one-way valve in here, 
so it allows air to go into the gas tank but will not allow gas fumes to exit the gas tank. So if you have a problem with an engine that's flooding, it might be because this is building up too much pressure. And while we're at it, we'll take off this linkage right here and that simply unhooks. It's kind of pivoted outwards and then it pulls out of place and then unhook the spring. We'll also take off this little spacer piece and gasket from the intake side. And it's important that when you put these on that these little pegs go on top of it, not on the bottom, otherwise you break the peg off. So now we'll spin it around to the muffler side. On the muffler side, there are two more nuts that hold this on. And these nuts actually have a stamped part right there on them because they're supposed to be a press fit or a tolerance fit so they don't vibrate loose. Now the muffler heat shield here um, basically has lots of holes in it, ventilation to help keep uh, anybody from accidentally touching the muffler which is the extremely hot part. Um, this still is warm, still is hot, will burn you, but less severely than the, the muffler actually will. And then the muffler will slide off next. And then the heat shield comes off after that. And the heat shield's going to help prevent, uh, basically separate, isolate the engine from the muffler and kind of keep heat from transferring back and forth between them. And these are supposed to be one-time use, but for our purposes, we keep rebuilding with them. Now we're going to go to the front of the engine and take off the valve cover. And these are four of the short bolts, 10 millimeter again. Cover comes off. Now, if this is an engine that you're taking apart for the first time, there will be a lot of oil that comes out of there. And then we've got the valve cover gasket. Once again, it's supposed to be one time use. And now you can see the valve train on the inside, rocker arms, springs, push rods. Now on the cylinder head, we've got these things called cooling fins, and these are what are going to increase surface area, so as the fan blows air past it, it helps keep the engine running a lot cooler. And always a good idea to rinse these off once in a while, keep any grass, dirt, leaves from collecting in there, which would cause it to overheat. And now we're going to take the flywheel brake off. Over on the side of the engine here are two 10 millimeter bolts. And underneath the flywheel brake is, are these little spacers that you got to make sure go underneath it, not on top of it when you put this back together. And these bolts are the long ones that have the little uh, unthreaded portion to them right where my thumb is at. 
And what this flywheel brake is going to do is as soon as you let go of the handle on a lawnmower, um, it is going to pull this piece over and that's going to rub on the flywheel. Also, through an electrical connection, um, when this piece touches the flywheel, that stops the spark, which instantly shuts the engine down. And these are those little spacer pieces you got to put back in the right spot. Now we're going to go to the dipstick tube right here, take that off. This is also one of the 10 millimeter long threaded rod, the long threaded bolts. And then the dipstick tube gently twists and that will pull out. At this point, we can flip the engine over and we're going to take apart the uh, oil pan or the engine sump. There are six bolts we're going to be taking out. And they look like that. And to crack the sump loose, what you want to do is kind of put your fingers on the side, thumb on the top here, and then it'll lift up. And this gasket is torn, so it would be time to replace that. And the next part we'll take out is going to be the camshaft. The camshaft is this part right here. And what you want to verify before you take it out is that these two dots right there line up. Right there is a dot. And then right over here is a circle, and they line up perfectly, which is the way it should be. Just take out the camshaft, gently lift up. Now your camshaft comes out. On the camshaft, you've got two lobes, one of them being the intake lobe, one of them being the exhaust lobe. And that's what's going to open and close the valves as the engine's running. So they'll push up on the push pins or the lifters and open and close the valves. This piece here is what makes it easier to start the engine. Basically, it dumps cylinder pressure when the stroke is halfway through, the piston's halfway up. A little compression reducer, so it makes it easier to pull it. And then once the engine's running, centrifugal force moves this over, and it moves that little piece out of the way, and now you run at normal compression. So that's low compression, high compression, low compression, High compression. And now there's a gear on the crankshaft, and that's going to be the crankshaft side of it. And before we take that out, there are these little push pin lifter pieces right here. Some people call them tappets. I'm going to take those out next. And they just slide out. And now we're going to take the piston out. Let's take the piston out, rotate this until the piston is all the way pretty close to the bottom where you can get to both of these bolts nice and easily. And again, you're going to take that 10 millimeter wrench. Loosen them. And then you take out both of these bolts right here. 
Now something you want to notice is there's a line on the connecting rod and the connecting rod cap. You should see that line on both of them. If you don't see the line, it means the connecting rod's on backwards or the cap's on backwards. There's the second one. And now our connecting rod cap comes off. And that's that little line I was telling you about. It's kind of hard to see. Now, before I put this away, um, this piece right here is the oiling system, lubrication system, and also the governor for the engine. Um, as this piece spins, this little paddle wheel basically flings oil much like uh, if you ride your bike through a puddle, the back wheel flings water up. This takes the oil and basically flings it all around the inside of the engine to lubricate all the pieces. Um, this little piece here is a centrifugal um, governor. And as the speed picks up, it basically pushes that little tab over. And as things slow down, comes back in. And that's what's going to control the engine speed. That little piece pushes on this arm, which connects up to that linkage to the carburetor. And so that's how it's going to control engine speed under load. Now what we need to do is rotate this and push the piston up near the top. So the bottom of the piston, bottom of the connecting rod right here is up near the top. And now when I back this up, the two separate and now I can remove my crankshafts. Now the crankshaft's out. Some key parts of the crankshaft here. You have counterweights that help balance the engine out or debalance the engine out. You also have the journal right here for the piston and that's what the connecting rod and connecting rod cap are going to go around. And then you also have the two bearing surfaces, uh, one for the flywheel side of it over here, and then the other bearing surface for the, um, in this case it's going to be the blade side of it, the lawnmower blade, but basically whatever load it is you're powering, it's going to be over on this side, so this one's a little bit wider. And now we can go up to the cylinder head. Do not, do not, do not try to take the piston off the bottom. It'll get stuck. Don't do that. And then you'll notice the two push rods are falling out. So we'll take those out too. <clears throat> to take the cylinder head off, what we're going to do is take out four bolts up here. There's two right here. And then on the inside, down towards the back, there's one bolt, and then over here, there's another one. Once again, 10 millimeter. And these are the four larger black bolts that the engine has for the cylinder head. Now 
a few parts of the cylinder head. Uh, you got the intake valve, the larger one right here. You got the exhaust valve. Um, on the other side, you've got the rocker arms. And then you also have the springs and the spring keepers. Now on the top of the engine, or it might be stuck on the bottom of the cylinder head, is going to be the head gasket. Once again, this is a one-time use, you're supposed to replace it. And then these two little dowel pins are going to come out, and that's what helps align the cylinder head. Now, we're going to take apart the cylinder head. So the secret to doing this is put your finger on the back side on the valve and then with your thumbs push down and unhook the valve spring keeper and then this will come off and now the valve will come up the bottom and on the intake side there's actually a little oil seal that needs to come out also. I'm going to do the same thing for the exhaust side. Put finger on the bottom of the valve, face of the valve, and with your thumb, push down, unhook it, and now you can take out that spring. The exhaust valve will probably just fall out like that one did. And now you have your cylinder head. You can see your valve seats right here and then also your spark plug right there. The last part we're going to take out is our piston and the way you take out the piston is push from the bottom down by where the journal would go and then put your hand over the top so that it doesn't fly away and basically push the piston out of the cylinder like that. Now the piston has three rings on it. In this case there is the oil ring on the bottom and the oil ring is what squeegees the oil off the cylinder wall and it'll be hard to see but on the inside there are actually little holes down here that allow the oil to go back into the bottom of the engine. There's also two compression rings on top here and these are what seal the uh, combustion the combustion on the top of the engine and they also seal the compression as the piston's moving up um, compressing air in the fuel. So you've got two solid rings right there called the compression rings. You've got the compression rings, two of them, and then the oil ring is the bottom wavy one. <coughs> now inside the cylinder is actually a crosshatch pattern and that is what traps a little bit of oil and helps lubricate the rings as they move up and down. So you see kind of the little scratching marks going on a diagonal, that's going to be your cylinder crosshatching. Now that we've taken the entire engine apart, we're going to go through the steps to put the engine back together. Um, most of the steps follow the Kohler engine manual available online. I'll put the uh, link to it in the description there. But we're going to follow the manual to put this all back together. So first thing we need to do is put the crankshaft back in. When you go to put the crankshaft back in, you're going to take a little bit of oil and coat this surface, this one, and the one over here with a little bit of oil to lubricate them. And then the gear needs to go up like this and then gently slide that into the engine. And then we're going to rotate it so the journal is down at the bottom of the engine. That's going to make installing the piston a lot easier. Now that the crankshaft is in, we're going to go ahead and install the piston.
And to install the piston, you're going to need a piston ring installer, piston ring compressor. And what you also want to do is take the gaps of the piston, like ones right there, and you want to set them opposite of each other, 180 degrees apart. So I have one gap over here, and I have the other gap over here. And that's going to maximize the compression. Um, also, there's a triangle on the top of the piston. That needs to point towards the square right here. Now you're also going to take a little bit of oil and coat this with a light coating of oil. And then take your piston compressor, piston ring compressor. And the ring compressor has these little notches, little indents. Those are there on purpose so that it doesn't get wedged between the piston and the cylinder wall. Take your little tuna can key here, open this up, put those notches so they are on the bottom. So my notch is right there. And it does help if you have a second person. Turn this so it's tight and now all of my rings are compressed on the inside. I'm going to set my piston into the bore. And my triangle is facing the square. And now what we're going to do is take a hammer and knock the piston into the bore. Now, this is an official piston or official hammer for putting the piston in, but you could also just take the handle of it and accomplish the same thing. And now the piston is in the cylinder. If it gets stuck, if it doesn't go all the way, just stop, take the piston back out, and do it over again. Just reset it. Uh, no big deal. Just got to do it a second time. Maybe a third time. Sometimes a fourth time. Now that the piston is in, we're going to tip the engine on its side. And we need to put the connecting rod cap in place. So I'm going to rotate my crankshaft so it lines up with my piston right here. And then we'll push this all the way down to the bottom. So now I can put my connecting rod cap on. You'll see the little line right there. And when I put my connecting rod cap on, I've got my line right there, my other line right there, right by my thumbnails. You're going to put a little bit of oil on here also. And take your two small black bolts, 10 millimeter, and put those in place. These are probably where it's been essentially not important as are sharp. There's one. Now the other bolt. And while you should use a torque wrench on there, what you're going to find is it is very difficult to get a torque wrench in there. So we are going to gently snug them down with our 10 millimeter wrench. connecting rod cap is in place. The torque spec for those is 110 inch pounds and that's what the torque wrench should be set at to torque this down. Now we're going to install the little tappets, these pieces here. Once again, take a little bit of oil. Smear oil around those, and then a little bit of oil around those surfaces. Push them into place gently. Right there. And now we're going to put our crankshaft in. Now before the crankshaft can go in, we need to get our alignment marks set perfectly 
and there's a dot right there and we need the line on our camshaft to line up perfectly with that as you put your camshaft in you're going to take a little bit of oil and lightly coat this with a little bit of oil same thing with the lobes and take an exhaust lobes and here is my dot that's going to line up perfectly with that dot Now you'll see both those dots line up 100% perfect and my engine will be properly timed. On top of here is a black washer. This one right here, the big black washer. That's going to go on top of the crankshaft. And now we're We're going to install our oil pan. Um, there should be two of these dowel pins right here, one there, one on the other side. Some of the engines do have them lost, they've been rebuilt so many times. And the other thing is this lever needs to go perfectly straight up and down. If it's not, it's going to get hung up on the little uh, governor pin. As you set the oil pan in place, this gasket should be replaced if you're doing this for real. But this pin right here, this little governor pin, that needs to be pushed in all the way. So I hold it in with my finger, set the oil pan in place, and then line it up perfectly. snaps in. If you did this right, you should be able to wiggle this linkage back and forth. If you cannot, it means you got that lever jammed up against the governor pin. So make sure that moves back and forth. Now we're going to take all six of our oil pan bolts. You're going to use your ratchet and 10 millimeter to tighten it. And one bolt tried to escape. Always start them by hand, and then you will torque them to the correct amount, which is 109 inch pounds or 12.3 Newton meters. So you take your torque wrench and your 10 millimeter. And you're going to go around and tighten all of these in a star pattern. To the correct amount of 109 inch pounds. Now we're going to put our cylinder head. Now that the cylinder head's put together, we're going to go through and install the cylinder head on top of the engine. So to do that, we're going to flip our engine upright. And now that the engine's upright, we need to take our little dowel pins that align the cylinder head with the block, which are uh, these two pieces, and put those in their correct spot. And then we are going to take our cylinder head gasket. Now, if you're doing this for real, this does need to get replaced. They are one-time use. 
but we're just practicing, so we're going to go ahead and reuse ours. And then we're going to take our cylinder head and set that on top. Now the cylinder head does only go on one way. This square part here needs to line up with that square part there. So we'll take that, set it in place. And now we will take our four black bolts and put those in place. Always start them by hand. And then the other two are going to go on the inside. And you will need to take a extension with your 10 millimeter to be able to get those in place. And to speed things up, I'm going to use the impact driver. And we do need to torque those to the proper specification. In this case, the proper torque spec is 246 inch pounds or 27.8 Newton meters. So we'll take our 10 millimeter socket, put it on our torque wrench. We're gonna set that for 246 inch pounds and torque these down. The next part we need to put in place is the push rod assembly. And the push rods are the two round metal rods that look like this. And they are a little tricky to put in place because they only they need to go in the top of the engine here, but it is not easy to see where they actually go. There is two little slots, one right there and one right there. And that's where the push rods need to go. All the way down at the bottom is that little lifter push pin piece that these need to set into. And they shouldn't fall all the way down. They should kind of sit right there. And both of these are in the correct spot now. And you probably will have to get a flashlight out, shine it in there to make sure they're in the right spot. And now what we need to do is set our valve lash. The way we're going to do that is we're going to take our rocker arms and the push rod has got a set in the little dimple part right there and we're going to lightly tighten this down just to hold it in place. Same thing over here lightly tighten it down to put it in place. Now something to um, note here is that because we lined up our timing dots that cylinder number one top dead center which means nothing will be pushing on my um, push pins down here, push rods or rocker arms. Everything has no pressure on it right now. You cannot do this adjustment unless it is set up that way. So what we need to do is take our feeler gauge and it's the 4,000s feeler gauge, 0 0.004. And we're going to put it between the valve tip, tip of the valve stem, and the rocker arm right here. And the feeler gauge should fit between the two of those with just a little bit of resistance. 
And once we have it, and you adjust it by turning this little uh, acorn nut, that's pretty close. And it is going to be guess and check. You will have to try several times to get this perfect. But what you're going to do to lock in the adjustment is put a 14 millimeter wrench on here, and then take a 10 millimeter wrench, and you're going to jam the two together. You're going to go like this and lock them together so that there's no pressure on the rocker arm, but they're jamming each other. They're jamming each other together. There we go. Now, what that looks like if I try it again, unfortunately, my feeler gauge does not go in there quite right, so I'm going to make a small adjustment. I'm going to loosen the 10. Back off the 14 just a little, and now tighten the 10. I'm going to jam them together. So that there's a little bit of play in the rocker arm. There it goes. And this should feel like you're dragging it along a magnet. That's the proper amount of resistance, just like you're dragging it on a magnet. And that's what I have right now. I need to do the same thing on the other side. Set the 14 on there. Take the 10. And now I'm going to jam the two together. And there should be just a little bit of wiggle. I'm going to take my 4,000 feeler gauge. And I have them a little too tight right now. That is not quite going in. So I'm going to loosen the 10 millimeter one and then bring the 14 over, loosen that just a little bit and now jam the two together again. And then my feeler gauge goes between the two, just a small amount of resistance, just like it should. And that is the proper amount of valve lash. Now the reason we want a little bit of valve lash is because as the engine heats up, the metal's all going to expand slightly and that's going to allow everything just a little bit of movement so that it's not pushing on the valves and holding them open while it's running. So there's a little bit of play now, but once the engine heats up, that'll go away, and the engine will have the tolerances that it's supposed to have. So that is setting up the valve lash adjustment. All right, now we're going to go ahead, since this is sitting the way it is, and put the valve cover on. And the valve cover also has the valve cover gasket, and these only go on one way. And this piece right here needs to go towards the top of the engine to support the cover later. There we go. Fits in place like it should. And now we're going to set that on. And this takes four short screws. Ten millimeter as usual. Always start them by hand. and then snug them down. These do have a torque spec of 71 inch pounds or 8 newton meters. And now that the valve cover's on, we'll go on to the next part, which is installing the flywheel brake assembly. Going to lay the engine down flat again. 
And this is that flywheel brake assembly. And if you recall, there are these two spacers that need to go in place underneath it. And you do need to use the bolts that have the unthreaded portion right here. And these do have a torque spec of 84 inch pounds or 9.5 newton meters. We are just going to gently tighten them. And now we're going to install the flywheel. The flywheel does have that keyway right there that needs to line up with the Woodruff key right there. So that goes into place. <clears throat> Next, the fan's going to go on, and you need to line these pegs up with the four peg holes here, and also the little teardrop shape it needs to line up. And then the pull cord catch is going to go on. Make sure that this little peg here goes into that one right there. It needs to go into that indentation right there. And then the 19 millimeter nut goes on next. Now we're ready to install the ignition module right here. And when you install the ignition module, you're going to use one of the bolts that's threaded all the way. Do not use the one that has an unthreaded portion or it will crack it just like this one's cracked right here. That's what will end up happening. So now we're going to install the ignition module. And the ignition module needs to use this screw that has a threaded portion all the way up. And the screw needs to go on the far side. And the gold colored stud needs to go on this side. And you might gotta have it so this little flat part right here, that needs to go against the ignition coil. Now the way this thing works is, as this square part right here that's magnetized, there's a magnet. As that magnet goes past the ignition coil, um, the magnetic field induces current and creates a spark. And that brief burst of electricity travels through the spark plug wire to the spark plug creating spark. And all this has to happen at the exact right time. So we need to adjust this so that it is not touching the flywheel but is very close to the flywheel. Now the way we're going to go about adjusting this is by taking a piece of cardstock. You could use a feeler gauge, but I find it's very difficult to do. Um, I would prefer to use cardstock. Also, if you use um, the cardboard from a 24 case of pop, um, that will also work the, just as well. So we put the cardstock in there and gently push the coil up against it. 
Another trick is to go where the magnet is, and the magnet actually holds it tight. Going to take your 10 millimeter and tighten it down. And for the other one, you have to use the 10 millimeter wrench, and you can use the open end to get it started. Now that the ignition module's in place and the fasteners are tightened down, we're going to torque them to the proper amount, which is 88 inch-pounds. Now that the air gap is set properly, we can take out the piece of paper our cardstock and we'll have the perfect amount of gap in here so that we have spark. And now we're going to install a fuel tank. fuel tank is also going to use two of the silver colored stud pieces. Make sure that the rounded part goes towards the bottom. Rounded part towards the bottom. And before we tighten those down, we're going to put the 10 millimeter screw down at the bottom. And use your ratchet to tighten that up. You are going to take your torque wrench and again tighten these down to 88 inch pounds. And that 88 inch pounds is not very much, so be gentle with those. So now our gas tank is on. And we are going to install the governor linkage. Make sure the fuel line is snaking through here. And we need to put on this little support bracket first. And screws only go in these two spots for right now. And it helps to leave it a little loose because when you go to put the air filter housing on, um, to get this lined up, it does help to be able to wiggle that around. And this spring's going to connect up to the little linkage arm down here. Like that.
And now the governor linkage arm is going to go on. And the spring is supposed to go through, or I should say the linkage should go through the spring like that. And the end with the little zigzag 90 degree part is going to hook in. And the spring will go in just below it. And now we've got to connect the other end to the carburetor. Before we put the carburetor on, we need to install the spacers. So the paper gasket and then the plastic spacer. And these two pegs do need to go on top, not on the bottom. We'll slide that on. And now the heat shield is going to go on. And this little hole is going to go towards the back side of it. Like that. It kind of curves around the engine. And now the carburetor is going to go on. And before you slide the carburetor on, you got to get the linkage dropped in place. So you line it up and then pivot. So now it locks in and slide that on. The little spring needs to get connected with the little hole that's right there. There we go. And now you notice this moves like it's supposed to and springs back like it's supposed to. Your fuel line needs to get connected to the carburetor. And then using your needle nose, grab the clip, slide that up. And now we're going to put on our air cleaner assembly. The air cleaner assembly slides onto the two studs right there. A long screw goes back here. Ten millimeter nut goes right here. And a second one right there. Now the air filter can go in. <clears throat> and the air filter cover. These two little clips hook in right here. And then it tightens down. The black hose is going to connect up to the little port that's back there. And what that does is it allows crankcase vapors to be drawn in and burned in the engine, help it run a little cleaner. And we got a little primer bulb. And now we'll install our dipstick tube right here. dipstick tube kind of pushes into place and you're going to need a long screw go 
always start it by hand and then use the ratchet. Now that's connected. The muffler assembly is going to go on next. And now we're going to install the heat shield for the muffler. And this goes on so that this little notch back here goes right here for the wire. And these are supposed to be one time use but we're going to reuse ours because we're just rebuilding our engines. After the heat shield goes on, then the muffler is going to go on. Make sure that this points forward. And after the muffler goes on, the muffler outside heat shield is going to go on. Once again, there's two little openings. And the muffler is supposed to use the nuts that have the little triangle stamped into the top. That creates a interference fit that's supposed to keep them from vibrating loose. So take a look through the ones that you have left and look for the ones with the little triangle stamping on top. And that's the ones you should be using here. And it's easiest to put them into the socket and then get them started because your fingers really don't fit in there. And the next piece we'll install is the wire for our coil. And there's a little clip right here that it snaps onto. And what ends up happening is when you're mowing the lawn or using the engine, you squeeze the handle and it pulls this back. And whenever you let go of the handle, there's a spring here that pulls it down and that helps stop the flywheel from spinning. It also grounds out the spark so that it no longer goes to the spark plug, instantly killing the engine. Now we're going to make our way to the top part of the engine. Now we're going to install the blower housing. But before you can put the blower housing on, you have to add your three little spacer adapters. One, two, three. And now the blower housing will fit over those. After you put on the blower housing, the pull cord assembly is going to go on. Make sure the spring, make sure the string goes to the back part of the engine. And it should fit around those little spacers. And then the engine cover goes on next. Make sure the gas cap is off. And we're going to put in the two 8 millimeter screws up front here first. Now that the cover's on, we're going to put our two 8 millimeter screws up in the front of the engine. And you're going to need an extension to get them into place. There's one side.
as you tighten those, be very, very gentle. Um, they are small screws. They will strip out very easy. Now we're going to take three more 10 millimeter nuts and put them up top here. And you're going to tighten these very gently because we're going to put a torque wrench on them. And we are going to torque them to 40 inch pounds, which is half as much as the stud, so that we don't cause the stud to break loose. So I'm going to take my torque wrench, turn it on. 40 inch pounds, I should say. <clears throat> And it is very light. It is not much pressure at all, but it's all it takes to hold this cover in place. So 40 inch pounds on those. Now we're going to install the engine cover. Gently pull the cord back a little bit and through the slot right there, put the string. You have to hook the front in first and then drop it down into place. There are those four T15 Torx screws. And you're going to put those in by hand very, very gently. It's just plastic that they're screwing into. It's just enough to hold them. And now the gas cap can go on. And if you did everything correctly, you should be able to pull this string and the engine should rotate just like that. If you're not able to pull the string, it means something on the inside wasn't assembled correctly and you got to take it back apart and figure out what's wrong. Congratulations on rebuilding your engine. I hope that you guys all got it back together with no leftover pieces. That is the secret, no leftover pieces. Uh, if you got any questions, put a comment down at the bottom. Otherwise, thank you for watching and have a good one.